You know, with all this voting on going on right now, I'm just going to say, I vote for March. <laughs> March! Yes. I'm delighted to introduce our uh, new speaker this morning, Dr. Shushi Kapila of the English Department and also of the Institute for Global Engagement. And I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. Um, before Shushi came to Grinnell in 2002, she taught at Kenyon College. She received her PhD in English from Cornell University and two, a BA and two MAs from Delhi University. At, at the college, she has taught the novel, uh, 19th and 20th century literature. Um, and then in, in 2017, she was asked to head up this new Institute for Global Engagement. And all she has to do in that job is <laughs> oversee a comprehensive intern, uh, internaliza, ex, internationalization of Grinnell. Yeah. I can barely say it. <laughs> Imagine doing it. For fun, Shuchi says she's learning to throw pots, and she loves to travel, and she loves to read about, and then cook new foods. She's talking about the uh, rise of Salman Rushdie, and welcome. Thank you. Oh, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> you know that I forgot to say that if you're using a T-cell, you should turn, coil, you should turn it on, and you should turn off your cell phone. Our usual, our standard. Uh, <coughs> so thank you very much, Janet, and uh, thank you all for uh, being here this morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, talk about some of the work that. Yeah? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. This might require a little adjusting. Now. Okay. Um, is that good? Yes. Fall off. Okay. So clearly I'm not ready for a TED talk. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I was saying it's a real pleasure to talk about some of the novels that I've loved teaching that are um, from India. I was told that there was interest in uh, thinking about India, so I've chosen Three, and I'm going to talk about one today, um, and I'm going to talk about a writer who is well known, <coughs> Salman Rushdie. Um, he's both famous and notorious, so that should give us some plenty to talk about. So I, what I thought I would do um, is to introduce to you, um, you know, English in India. So I often get this question, and I think this is sometimes um, a sort of mystery. Um, to to people. Can you hear? Is that, can you hear me? I'm getting an echo. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Is that good for everybody? Okay. Um, so what I thought I might do is talk a little bit about how English got to India, because um, it's often a, a source of great. Um, you know, bewilderment to people that uh, English is actually one of the many languages that is spoken in India and not only spoken but that people write in it and have been writing in it for decades. She's still hearing the echo. Okay. Would you be able to use the hand mic to try that? Or? Okay, sure. We need to hold up against you. Stand and talk across the top of it. All right, this is better? Okay, can everybody hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, so, talking about how English got to India. Um, what I thought I would do is first give you a little historical kind of, you know, um, a story of what was happening and how English got to India, and then talk about, jump from there to the 1980s and what I call the rise of Salman Rushdie. So, um, 
the story um, is, so I like to play this language game to start with and to ask you all whether you, some of you may have seen this, so those who saw this while we were setting up aren't allowed to say anything. Um, some of you uh, may wonder or may, have, may not have given thought to where these words come from. Um, Okay. So do we know this word? Kamarban? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I actually only saw a gentleman wearing a kamarban maybe two weeks ago. <laughs> but is this is this like a popular article of clothing? Formal. 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 Okay. So can anyone tell me what it means? Around the waist. I mean, it is a sash and it's around the waist, okay? But is that what it means in English? Okay, any idea where this might come from? Yes. So, it's actually Urdu and Persian. So it comes, you know, from, uh, it has a sort of Persianate uh, etymology. It means to tie your waist. And so part of what I'm saying isn't just that the English went to India, it's that a lot of Indian words are part of English as well, right? So there was this kind of exchange of language. Um, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with Salman Rushdie, but, it, but I'll, I'll make a connection with why it matters when we read his, his books. Uh, what about this word? <laughs> we all have them. Okay, so uh, in English, what does pajama mean? I mean, is that an English word again? All right, so we don't stop to think that where this word comes from, right? It's, maybe it's French? It could be French, I don't know. Okay, so it's again from Urdu and partly from Persian. And um, pai is actually legs and jama is the clothing of the leg, right? So, or foot. So as you can see, it's an article of clothing that, was, that is still very much part of, you know, gentlemen's wear, formal wear in India. But when we say PJs and we say pajamas, it's, it's just uh, a word that we don't even think of as not English. But all of these words really were absorbed by the language um, as, as the British uh, went to India. What about this one? It's one of my favorites. It's like shampoo. We use this, we use this every week. So do the French. <laughs> yeah, right? But it isn't. Um, and actually, shampoo sounds French to me, yeah. frankly. <coughs> actually, it is French. No? 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 You don't think it's French? No. Okay, well, actually, shampoo, I think, is probably French. However, it comes from a word um, that's a Hindi word. That is chumpy, which means to rub, like rub your head. This isn't something we do here, but um, in South Asia, um, rubbing oil into your hair is a weekly ritual. And in fact, it can be, um, or used to be, something that roadside barbers did and offered as a service. Um, and it's amazing. I actually encourage everybody to try a hot oil massage. It's so amazing. But that's where the word comes from. Again, a sign of how language has traveled all this time. So it's, you know, it's Hindi, Chappi, to, to rub, and a popular and soothing South Asian ritual. Um, just for fun, I wanted to show you, because I haven't found this anywhere else, evidence of a roadside barber. They're pretty, um, they're pretty sort of, you will find them, they're quite popular in South Asia. They sort of sit in roadside, you know, shacks and offer haircuts and offer gentlemen, um, you know, a shave and so on, right? But there's a Hindi movie that has memorialized this idea, has actually made immortal the idea of a chumpy as someone who is peddling his wares out in the street and singing about it. And it's a black and white 1950s movie that is much beloved in the Hindi-speaking world and actually uh, anywhere uh, where Hindi cinema is loved. And I thought I might just play you that. So what he's saying there is that I'll, he's saying I'll take care of you, right? So you can, you can guess that. Let me just get out of this. All right. 
All right, so Shen Hu. So that's just a long story of Shen Hu to, to sort of show you some of the ways these influences went into English. But um, how did we get from having Hindi in English to actually English being in India? And so um, in the last many decades, we thought of English production in India um, or English in India as uh, partly uh, related to outsourcing. Right? Capitalist outsourcing, many of you, when you have, your computers are not working, um, you know, you make a phone call and it's somebody sitting in Bangalore telling you his name is John, and all of that, that's by now a well-known story. Um, English in India um, is, is not as prevalent as we think it is, but it obviously has been present for long enough that it presented a, a ready-made labor market when outsourcing was important. The story goes back much further. It goes back to the 19th century. And um, um, I want to take you to a moment in the 19th century, especially in 1835, when um, English had been, for a while in India, had been studying Persian, had been studying Sanskrit, and uh, constituted a group that called themselves the Orientalists. Right, so this is, I think, a very different way that the British arrived in India. They went as a trading company. The East India Company was formed in 1600. They arrived there. They did have a lot of respect for the kind of languages and traditions in a way um, that I think is very different from other contexts where they went. Um, they found, you know, 5,000-year-old um, epics, and they found languages, and they wanted to produce grammars, and they wanted to kind of engage with them. So this group called themselves the Orientalists, and um, one of them, William Jones, is an eminent philologist, studied Persian, studied Sanskrit, Bengali, Hindi, Tibetan, Pali. I mean, it's amazing. I can't even think of that level of linguistic competence. He established the Asiatic Society of Bengal, and he was among the first scholars to propose the Indo-European family of languages. So he's, you, might, you might consider him a kind of precursor of you know, modern linguistics. The others were um, a man called James Prinsa, um, somebody uh, called A.J. Wilson. All of these people really engaged with uh, many Indian languages in the subcontinent and felt that that's where educational policy should go, is developing what you might call regional and vernacular languages. Okay, so along comes. Uh, Thomas Macaulay. I'm looking at the historian in the room who probably, or at least one historian I know, who probably knows Macaulay from the British concept, uh, British uh, context. So Macaulay arrives in India. He's made the um, he's made president of the committee on public <coughs> instruction, and there's a debate in the committee among the Orientalists and what we now call the Occidentalists. One group says we should be cultivating the local regional languages. The other group says, no, we should put money into teaching Indians English. Right? And with so much scholarship and so much influence, the Orientalists lost. And Thomas Macaulay wrote a famous minute that I always teach in my classes in which he compares the study, he compares English to Latin and Greek. Because at that time, in universities all over England, people were not studying English literature. They were studying Latin and Greek. English was not a thing. Right? This is my students are always surprised when I, when I say that English literature, our research tells us, first became a discipline in the colonies. Because the British felt that they, like the Romans, and like earlier empires, should also share their their civilization, that meant their culture, their language, and so on. And so, um, this is a very strange thing. Whenever I would visit um, members of the Indian Civil Service, which is the highest ranked service in India, who are kind of think tanks to the government, I would always notice that they had Shakespeare in their libraries. <laughs> and it was, it was always a matter of surprise until you know, I started to do this work. And realized, so there's a scholar called Gauri Vishwanathan at Columbia, who's written a book called Masks of Conquest. And what she says is that the British wanted their empire to have the same kind of glory like the Roman Empire. The argument that Macaulay makes is, just as Greek to us, English will be to Indians. Right? That it would become 
a classical language that would become a language that people would, you know, think in, write in. So do you think that happened? Maybe. Maybe, to some extent. I'm sorry? Lingua franca. So it is a kind of lingua franca, but it's also important, I think, to note that it exists among many other languages. So Macaulay's minute. The other things that, and I'll just show you a map, you know, to precisely to that point. So Macaulay's minute um, that he wrote in 1835 says, I've never read an Indian language, but I can bet that a single shelf of our literature is better than all the libraries in Asia. Never having, the minute says, I've never read an Indian language. However, I've talked to people, and I can figure it out, that a single shelf of our books is equal to all the libraries in Asia. And then at the end, this is, um, this is interesting, he says, um, it was a policy. He says, we must at present do our best to form a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern. A class of persons, Indian in blood and color, but English in tastes, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. To that class, we may leave it to refine the vernacular dialects of the country, to enrich those dialects with terms of science, borrowed from the Western nomenclature, and to render them by degrees fit vehicles for conveying knowledge to the great mass of the population. So these sort of interpreters, and I think of this kind of person, you know, Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. That is, you're a kind of hybrid creature. You look Indian, but you are English, right? In terms of, this is what they wanted. What in fact happened? They did produce a class of Indians like this. Very much so, who joined the ranks of the civil service, who became rulers, who became, you know. But this particular project of Mukhale also produced Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, B.R. Ambedkar, and the Indian Freedom Movement. Because educated in English as they were, they went to study law in London, and came back and said, okay, if we are citizens of the empire, let's talk. Right? That's basically what Gandhi said. And so um, it was partly that education, partly a rediscovery of the difference, partly a refusal. You all know that Gandhi wore that very minimal clothing. Right? You know that he had this shawl and he had this. And someone said, don't you feel embarrassed you're going to meet the king of England? And he said, the king has his plus fours. I like my minus fours. <laughs> I mean, he was, you know, he was always ready with a response. But partly, he comes back and he gives up Western clothing and decides that he's precisely not going to be, you know, Indian in taste, in opinions, and so forth. Right? Because the autobiography is really a reflection on what it means to be a modern Indian who does not want to be a hybrid like that. But that was the plan of the British, to create a class of people who would then be the mediators and who would learn English. So um, uh, I will say that uh, in some sense, I am a product of that um, moment. First institutions of higher learning were set up in India at University of Calcutta, University of Bombay, University of Madras in 1857. And then Punjab University 1885, Allahabad University 1887. Many of them had English departments as well. Right? And it wasn't until 1920 that English was formally declared a discipline at Oxford and Cambridge and in British universities, whereas departments of English already existed in the colony. So this is so when people say, you know, you, you speak English really well, I'm like, um, yeah. <laughs> um, that is if you have a certain kind of education. No more, I think, than about 11% of people in India are fluent in English. It is a privilege, still, to be educated in English. So Macaulay's Minute had very strange effects in the future. As you can see, this is what I mean. Here are all the languages that were recognized. So, yes, English exists, but not only do writers write in these, um, but people speak these languages. and. Um, you know, this does become important for a writer who's planning to represent Indian reality in one language. How are you going to do it? 
all around you people speak these languages. I grew up with three languages in the house. It's just what you assumed. My parents spoke Punjabi. Um, that was their code language. They didn't want us to learn Punjabi, but you know what? I did. Because if, if parents are speaking a language um, you know, in front of the children, you, it's a passive acquisition, but when I had to speak, I and mean, recently I went for research to an area in the Punjab, and I had to speak to the taxi driver, and he complimented me and said, I can't tell you've come from the United States. And I thought, okay, passive acquisition, but I guess it's all in my head. And then we grew up speaking Hindi, you know, learned Hindi and English at school, when it started when I was three years old. And then uh, my parents wanted me to learn a classical language, so I studied Sanskrit in college. And it was, it was just, it's not first or second, it's just, it's simultaneous. That's a big challenge for those who chose to write in English. And, you know, I'll maybe say a little bit about that. Um, here's what the language map looks like, I sort of love that. That's a part of India that is sort of amazing. If you look at the 22 languages recognized by the Constitution, they say there are many, many more that could be called either dialects or full languages. And um, Hindi speaking area is huge, but otherwise um, you can see how many uh, different parts of the country are different groups. So if you travel through India, yes, you know every every hundred miles language changes and food changes. It's more like a, it is a it is a continent rather than a country. And that's precisely what Rushdie's challenge was. How do I write a continent in one novel? Right. And the fact that he attempted it is part of what I'm. Uh, about to sort of talk about a little bit more um, as we come to as we come to the novel. So maybe it will make more sense if I um, if I talk a little bit about uh, the novel itself. So I here I want to make sure I keep an eye on on time. Um, okay. So Rashti, the rise of Rashti. This is sort of my Point. So there were writers in English in the 1930s who were attempting to create the rhythms of Indian speech in English um, and who actually were friends with the Bloomsbury group of you know, Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, others um, lived in different parts of the world. One of them, Mulkraj Anand, collaborated with Gandhi in the sense he showed Gandhi the manuscript of his first novel, The Untouchable. Um, so it isn't as though Indian writing wasn't happening, but something different happened in the 1980s. In 1981, you all know that the Booker Prize is uh, the prize that is, that's given for best English fiction and has this has been the case for decades. In 1981, the Booker Prize went to Salman Rushdie. He was uh, not very well known and his Midnight's Children won the award. And obviously there was much talk of, wow, an English novel, a prize for an English novel went to an Indian, Pakistani, Britain, British person. Who is this person? Um, Rashi has a lot to say about that hybridity, the fact that till 10 years old, he lived in Bombay, the family part of it migrated to Pakistan. He basically had his education in England, right? but in England, he was Indian. So he had, you know, he studied history, um, at Cambridge, and so he had a very kind of upper class education. But when he got the award, um, 25 years later, 1993, the Booker decided to uh, institute an award called the Booker of Bookers, and Rashdi got it again. Right. So I'm talking to you about him today, not just because of his celebrity and the fact that he arrived on the scene at a certain moment and started our interest in Indian writing, but also because he is this person who tries to literally swallow many continents and you know produce them in his books. So England is there, India is there. You know uh, he's also written about many other places. Uh, some of you may know his, him from the controversy. Do you? All, uh, I don't know if we all remember the controversy with the Satanic verses in 1988. It's sort of unfortunate that he got so associated with that. He wrote against the Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran, who then um, had a fatwa against him. Rushdie had to go into hiding. He was protected by the British government for many years. Um, I've tried to teach satanic verses maybe once, and it is an interesting novel, but yes, there are passages there that are very, I would say, offensive to people. And um, you know, it was banned in India 
It was burnt on the streets in Bradford in England. The people were infuriated that he insults the prophet. And Rajdi, um, this is sort of one of the things that he really believes and he says it is the business of the writer to offend. You know, it's his, he thinks that writers are not there just to entertain. They are there to speak truth to power. And so it's very exciting to find that, I mean, he takes all kinds of risks. Satanic Verses was one. Midnight Children was banned in India when it came out. And I hope that I can you know, share with you um, why. So to go straight to that, the first point I want to make, I don't know if any of you were able to read what I sent, and it is sort of a, a long novel, so um, you know, hopefully you want to read it. Um, it has so much in it. I would say, Rajdi attempted to write an epic for a new nation. And so that's one. He was writing about modern India with all of its diversity and you know, everything that comes with it. He gave us a new and strange kind of hero. First of all, his hero is Muslim. His name is Salim Sanai. And he comes from Kashmir, which is right now, as you know, in a huge kind of India and Pakistan are quarreling about Kashmir. Um, he comes from Kashmir, and as the novel opens, his body is falling apart. That's a weird kind of hero. Not brave, not powerful, right? But someone whose body is falling apart, and who says, I better finish writing this before I fall apart. So that was the first central idea of the novel, is this very strange hero. It also is in this form we call magical realism. That is, magic things can happen, but they're also kind of real. I mean, that literally is how I understand magical realism. It's almost as though it's an excess of the real. And I feel like one of the things about India that I both love and find hard to translate is precisely the success. When you go there, you experience an abundance of taste and color and sound and people and languages and food. And so how to bring all that into language and the novel seems to be his challenge. So the central fantasy of the novel is that Salim Sinai is born at midnight. Any thoughts on why that might be significant? <coughs> so, Midnight's children. Salim Sinai is born at midnight because India apparently got freedom at midnight. Right? The two nation states of India and Pakistan took uh, the 14th of August and the 15th of August as their independence days, and at midnight, um, Basically, it was declared that India would be free, right? Um, and Salim Sanai is born in the hospital at midnight, so he gets a special letter from the Prime Minister congratulating him and saying, you are the future of the nation. But very interestingly, he doesn't say he is the nation and he isn't the nation. He says, I was born handcuffed to history. <coughs> I love that. It's like, not exactly that I am history. It's like, I'm handcuffed to it. I can't escape. Right. History is me. And um, when he's born in the hospital, his parents, or his, uh, it's sort of like a nanny figure, um, there is another child born in the same hospital of an Englishman and a street performer. And the nanny feels very really sorry for this other child and switches the kids. And this is a plot that you will often find um, in Hindi cinema. Baby switched at birth, you know, triplets lost, reunited. This is so, this is part of what Rajiv does and the way he brings India into his novel is the plots are really melodramatic, reminding you a little bit about cinema. So, um, he's born at midnight and together with him, there are a thousand children born at midnight, he says. So I just want to connect this midnight with this speech that you'll see in the end. <coughs> when we were children, because it's like a well-known fact, right, that uh, freedom came at midnight. 
So the central conceit of the novel is that these children are born at midnight, and um, all of them come with special powers. Not only that, the children of midnight um, eventually, it turns out, by the time Salim reaches adolescence, can telepathically hear each other. So it's like a radio in his head. All the children of midnight can hear each other. And what Rashdi's trying to set up there, right, from his story of his great-grandfather coming down from Kashmir, becomes a doctor, the first part of, you know, India's freedom, the language riots that led to the formation of the states of Maharashtra and Gujarat that we just saw, Marathi and Gujarati were two separate languages. All of that is encapsulated in with sort of breathless speed in the first 20, 30 pages of the book. You know, and part of what he's trying to say is, okay, all these children were born with magical powers. So at the moment of midnight, there was a potential for India to become something special. So um, I might want to pause here and then take on the story as it develops in a little bit and show you some more. Um, I think it's probably time for break. Is there is there a question that I can take at this point? Okay, sure. I wondered if any of the written uh, Indian indigenous languages uses the Latin alphabet. Um, okay, so this is a very complicated question for me. So not only do we ha oh yes, sorry, repeat the question. So do any of the Indian languages have Latin script, right? Okay, um, most Indian languages have their own script. So that you're learning not only a language, but also a script. Does that make sense? What does script mean? Um, letters, alphabets, you know, the, all of it is not, it's not romanized. And so if I was to try to read, let's say, um, Tamil, which I don't read at all, its alphabet is completely different from Hindi. If I was to read Tamil, I would have to romanize it into English before I could read it, unless I meant to learn Tamil straight from, you know, uh, from its, its alphabet. So, in fact, um, often the languages do not share a script. Yeah, and so you can see the, the kind of vast um, effort that went into the first British linguistics. I always say, this was a war, imperialism was a war, but it was a very different kind of war. Latin, unlike nothing we've seen, where people would actually bother to learn the languages and scripts of the country they meant to rule, because the idea was you should know the languages of the people, right? That you mean to govern. It's not about dropping dropping bombs and you know sending soldiers. It was about that too. But there was there's so much that came out of that contact. <coughs> not all of it good, but I'm going to tell you a good story. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a once again. We think we've got it. We think we've got the sound system working in a way that everybody can hear without an echo. So we're going to give it give it a try. Okay. All right. Good. Can everybody hear me now? No echoes. Okay. I think we may have just figured it out. That. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. Right. This is an a epic battle between my hair and the mic. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so we stopped at the moment where I talked about the, um, the children of midnight. And um, I wanted to show you, I wanted to start by showing you um, a little clip of Salman Rushdie's interview um, where he's talking about uh, his, and I'm going to try to sort of take it right to that clip where he's talking about, um, you know, his own life. Um, and so I should say that I don't think that writers necessarily have to reflect their biography or that's necessarily the strongest way to read their work because they have so much going on in their heads. But it is interesting that he comes from a certain moment. Let me see if I can find exactly that clip, and I just want to play it for you. A good way to position Midnight's Children, um, you know, that's what he's trying to do is show you 
some of what the past is and then also the future. So um, this is what uh, he says. And he says, in fact, all over the new India, the dream we all shared, children who were being born who were only partially the offspring of their parents. The children of midnight were also the children of the time. Father, you understand by history it can happen, especially in a country which is itself a sort of dream. So this is something that Rushdie attempts to um, you know, deal with, that India is often thought of as a dream. Why? Because as a concept, it's kind of impossible. It's a continent that became a country, pretty much. And so, um, so magical realism seems both appropriate as, as an almost like a, a translation of the reality that it had so many possibilities when it first became free. Um, and so Rashti thinks of himself also as this kind of transitional generation. Um, and so one of the plots in the novel, remember I was telling you about the switch children right before break. So it's an Englishman who owns the apartment complex in which all of the friends of Salim and I live, who has fathered this child. So in, in effect, the child Salim is a child of an Englishman and an Indian woman. And he's switched and becomes part of the Sanai family. Right? So there's a kind of way that the British Empire, it's sort of like the last whiff of the British Empire that comes in into the story that way. And so our hero is part English, actually. Of course, you never get a sense of it because he's raised in a Muslim family. So um, the other point I want to uh, just share with you is that the novel tries to um, encapsulate this diversity of India. And one of the ways it does this, you know, India is a place that has brought in waves of, of the Hukuns, the Afghans, the Greeks, the Mughals, the British um, to its shores. And so how to take all those histories, since he's a student of history, he also wants to include um, you know, a lot of its history. How to do that seems to be one of his challenges. He invents a language that is permeated with Indian life. Right? Especially when it comes to Indian food. So food is really important. Um, and that might be one of the reasons I like the novel, because you know I like reading about food. Um, one of the things he says right at the beginning, he says, rising from my pages comes the unmistakable whiff of chutney. So do we, do we all eat chutney? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so in our family, we always have this quarrel. My American husband loves Major Grace chutney. I always look at him and say, who is Major Grey anyway? We probably <laughs> got it from India. And it's mango chutney that he loves. And I, I say to him, the British don't know a thing about mangoes. This is bound to be something that this person, whoever Major Grey is, found there. I think that's true, right? Um, but chutney is a condiment that, again, it's a word that's in the in English language. Um, and it's that and pickles form some of the metaphor that organizes the novel again and again. Rising from my pages comes the unmistakable whiff of chutney. I, Salim Sinai, possessor of the most delicately gifted olfactory organ in history, have dedicated my latter days to the large-scale preparation of condiments. And my chutneys and kasandis are, after all, connected to my nocturnal scribblings. By day, amongst the pickle bags. By night, within these sheets, I spend my time at the great work of preserving. Memory, as well as fruit, is being saved from the corruption of the plots. So, the idea that it's this complicated history that is, he's trying to write in the pages of the novel, and the idea that in the plot, when you find Salim, his body's falling apart, he works in a pickle factory, and his friend Padma helps him along. Padma also becomes his first audience. And it's very funny because all through she says, you've taken 20 pages to start your story. At this point, the novel will end and you wouldn't have been born. <laughs> then she says, this is too complicated. Why are you messing with the plot? So there's a lot of conversation about the act of writing itself. And Padma becomes, you know, the person who eggs him on and says, tell me your story, tell me your story. That's what's happening in the plot. So the idea of chutney, at the end, Rajdi calls it the chutneyfication of history. I just love that term. Right, that it's, it's um, and you know, Indian pickles and chutneys are very different. I don't know, have you had Indian pickles? They're less easy to find, but I'm sure we're all Many of us travel, and so Indian pickles are different from the kind of cucumber and brine idea. Um, they have many, many, many spices. They're cured over a period of time in oil. 
They take five to six months to kind of cure themselves. They are very, very concentrated, sharp, tangy, sometimes sweet, very spicy. And um, I've had friends who will sort of take a spoonful of pickle and put it in their mouth and then run screaming out of the room. So you just don't do that when you have pickles. You want to take a very little bit, mix it with rice, and sort of bury it in something that's not spicy and then get that, that kind of, you know, it's very packed with flavor. So when he says that it's like pickle, the pickle factory becomes the way, the place of preserving of memory. It's interesting he takes that very Indian idea of what it means to write and what it means to remind oneself of history. Um, so that's the sort of the, the pickle factory idea. So in uh, terms of the diversity um, and, and bringing all this together, at another point in the novel he says, when the women of the Sinai household are quarreling with each other, he writes, Mary Pereira took the time to prepare for the benefit of their visitors some of the finest and most delicate mango pickles, lime chutneys, and cucumber pasandis in the world. And now restored to the status of daughter in her own home, Amina, who is Salim's mother, began to feel the emotions of other people's food seeping into her. Because Reverend Mother doled out the curries and meatballs of intransigence, dishes of stubbornness, and the biryanis of determination. <laughs> so Reverend Mother is like the grandmother he spoke about, towering figure in the house, won't stand for any nonsense. And the way she controls the entire household is through food. That just happens throughout the novel. Women are powerful. But I always ask, ask my students, you know, are they powerful? Because they're, they're fighting these battles through food. So it's very interesting how he, how he represents these women characters. Um, and then, you know, at the end he says, as he becomes a master of pickling, he says, the intricacies of turmeric and cumin, the subtlety of fenugreek. I don't know if you all have eaten fenugreek. It's very, very powerful. Your neighbors will know that you've eaten fenugreek. <laughs> when to use large and when small cardamoms, the myriad possible effects of garlic, garam masala, stick cinnamon, coriander, ginger, not to mention the flavorful contributions of the occasional speck of dirt. <laughs> In the spice spaces, I reconcile myself to the inevitable distortions of the pickling process. To pickle is to give immortality. After all, fish, vegetables, fruit, hang, embalmed in spice and vinegar, a certain alteration, a slight intensification of taste is a small matter, surely. The art is to change the flavor in degree, but not in kind. And above all, to give it shape and form, that is to say, meaning. I've mentioned my fear of absurdity. So part of what drives Salim is that <coughs> such a complicated country will be lost unless he writes it. Just like unless you pickle and preserve that fruit is lost, right? So he takes all these very Indian images and his act of writing becomes, you know, so many ingredients, so many languages, so much that has happened to the country. Um, if you read it, you'll find that, yeah, it's very fast-paced and, you know, one of, one of the challenges then becomes um, keeping track of everything that happens. Um, the other thing he says about diversity, where he grows, is, uh, grows up is an apartment complex and um, the people who live there, Evie Burns, that name suggests to me possibly English origins, his friends, these are his close friends, Sunny Ibrahim, Ice Flies and Hair Oil Sabarmati, those are the names he's given these kids, those are Parsis, Cyrus Dubash, Parsi, and Monkey, he calls a brass monkey, that's his sister. That apartment complex in Bombay has Muslims, Parsis, Hindus, you know, many, many different kinds of, and then Anglo-Indians or, you know, a kind of international. So, Bombay, like New York, is this, I also think of this as a Bombay novel, right now called Mumbai. Bombay um, is like New York, it's extremely cosmopolitan. And our experience growing up in India, mine at least, was that you had people of all, many different faiths, people who spoke many different languages, all around you. Um, I've been returning to Midnight Children thinking that, you know, it's sort of been dormant for so many years, I mean, I teach it quite often, but that it has a special meaning today where India is being presented by the current government as a Hindu nation. It is a Hindu majority nation, yes, 80% of its people are Hindu. But the kind of Hinduism I grew up with, when I was young, my mother would take me to the neighborhood Muslim saints place, 
just so we could listen to the Kawali, which is a kind of devotional form of music. And because she said, a holy person is a holy person. Doesn't matter what religion you are from. And I studied in, in Catholic school. And when I would come home and say to my parents, you know, I love going to chapel. It's so quiet and the pews are just so beautiful. And my parents would say, sure. Right? But it's also true that I never had any doubt that I was Hindu. And I've never had any doubt that I will always be Hindu. Right? So that's, there was no, there was no fear in independent India. You could be, you know, whoever you were with a variety of, you went to, I went and celebrated Eid with people. I went, I, when I taught at a college there, a university is one of the most cosmopolitan places. It's like an amazing place to be in India. Um, I had friends who would uh, celebrate Christmas. So we went to their house and did the tree. I never had a tree at home because we didn't do Christmas. That's the dead of the year for Hindus. Our holy days start again, you know, somewhere in January. So the fact that Rashti invokes this flavor, this texture of people with different names, running around, coming from different homes, but playing together as teenagers, was very true of the India he grew up in. I would say even up till my time. Um, and he tries to capture that. And then he goes on to say, um, and I just want to read you this, he says, understand what I am saying. During the first hour of August 15, 1947, between midnight and 1 a.m., no less than 1,001 children were born within the frontiers of the infant sovereign state of India. What made the event noteworthy was the nature of these children. Every one of them was, through some freak of biology, or perhaps owing to some preternatural power of the moment, or just conceivably by sheer coincidence, endowed with features, talents, or faculties, which can only be described as miraculous. So many of these children don't survive. By the end, he says, by 1957, the surviving 581 children were all nearing their 10th birthdays, wholly ignorant for the most part of one another's existence. And then Salim's head becomes a radio that hears these voices. 581, that's how many seats we have in Parliament. Right? So it really is a political allegory somewhere of the promises of India at independence. Just the kind of plenitude of things that could happen. Then the novel goes on to the 1950s. Just want to show you that for people reading the novel, um, you know, some of the references would be really kind of um, obvious. So Salim's rebellious and feisty sister, we call Brass Monkey, ends up becoming a famous singer in Pakistan. And she has the power to reduce people to tears when she sings. Um, and then there's a little bit about Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India and the wars that happened as you go through the middle portion of the book. But of course, as you're reading this, um, just to kind of capture again the kind of local flavor of what he's trying to say, there is a very famous Indian singer, and I wish I could play you a song, called Lata Mangeshkar. She's in the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest number of songs sung by one person. Here she's very young, she's in her 90s now. And Lata, you can see Jawala Nehru there, sang for the soldiers who lost the war the war between India and China in 1962, and when she sang, Nehru cried. Right? So what Rashti does is he takes that plot and makes it you know, somewhere in Pakistan, but he's using all of the various episodes of subcontinental history in creating his characters. So she sang this song called Air Meir Kilogo, which is, you know, people of the country, and she's uh, singing for the soldiers who died. And Nehru wept because you know that India lost the war and Nehru blamed himself because he said we were not ready. And because the war had been preceded by feelings of brotherhood and friendship between India and China, or so India thought, or so Nehru thought. I think he was incredibly naive at that point. Um, but then since then India has maintained this army because of the war it shares, shares with China. So, you know, there are not um, moments like this. So, um, moving, moving ahead, so we have a little time for your questions and maybe for a conversation. It's an incredibly difficult novel to encapsulate, but I just want to make one more point, which is that it's woven out of, for the first time, elements of fantasy, Indian epics, um, Hindi cinema, as I showed you, melodrama, epic, and fiction. Um, he uses, for instance, the, the Indian epic Ramayan. I don't know if you all are aware of this. It's um, 
Sort of like the, for us, it's sort of like the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Ramayana and Mahabharata are two great epics in India. And some of the, it's a Hindu epic, he takes, you know, some episodes from there. So the demon king Ravana becomes a bad businessman. He has the monkey king Hanuman in there. He has Ram as a character. This facility, you could say, you could argue that as a Muslim, it's strange that he uses so many Hindu um, references. This was never an issue in the India in which I grew up. Right? That I knew the, some parts of the Bible. I knew some quotations that my parents quoted from you know, Sikhism. Very syncretic culture, at least for a while. It was a fantasy of an India where everybody knew everybody else in a friendly way. Right? And so, um, so, so um, as we move forward, the culminating, I'm just coming now to the last part of the novel, which is as interesting as what comes before, and a lot happens before he goes to Bangladesh, he fights as a soldier, and the whole thing of going through the forests of Bangladesh, and it was a complete bloodbath. The Pakistani army sent its army to suppress um, what was then East Pakistan, suppress the rebellion, but Bangladeshis wanted their own country, and you know that part of Pakistan became Bangladesh in 1971. So the last part, we land up outside the slums of Delhi. It's now the 1970s. One of the magical Midnight's children is Parvati the witch. And she lives there with a character called Picture Singh, who is the patriarch of the magician's ghetto. And he entertains people, as the name Picture Singh says. He's sort of a snake charmer. He also shows pictures of people, you know, those, what do you call them? Not sure what you call them, but you go inside uh, a cloth and you're able to see um, various images of the world before the moving image was a thing. So um, Picture Singh, and is part of a slum. Now the reality of Delhi is that 60% of Delhi is a slum and then you have, this is the capital, and 40% is the middle class and upper middle class. The 60% pretty much supports the 40%, as you might imagine. All of your services come from there. But it's also a very major vote bank. You always find politicians going there making promises because many, many of your votes are going to come from there. Right? India is a very, very kind of vital democracy in that respect. So, um, in this ghetto, in Rajdi's imaginings, he says, the problems of the magician's ghetto were the problems of the communist movement in India. Within the confines of the colony could be found in miniature the many divisions and dissensions which racked the party in the country. Picture Singh, I hasten to add, was above it all. The patriarch of the ghetto, he was a possessor of an umbrella whose shade could, shade could restore harmony to the squabbling factions. And this actually is true. India's communist movement that was allied with both Russia and China never quite got kind of federal status or federal power <coughs> to date. It holds power in the states of Kerala and Bengal. And it had a very kind of iffy relationship to the nationalist movement. That's why Gandhi and others dominated. The left kind of withdrew. But it has had a strong tradition of a communist party that's always in the election. So part of what Rajdi is trying to say is that failed promise of the magician's colony. They could make anything happen. It's very beautifully written. You know, Parvati, the witch, lives there. Um, they, do, they do various things to entertain people. So they're a kind of colony of entertainers, um, which is kind of interesting that he imagined the Communist Party like that. Uh, and he says, but the disputes which were brought into the shelter of the snake charmer's umbrella were becoming more and more bitter. The pullers of rabbits from hats aligned themselves firmly behind Mr. Dan's Moscow line which supported Mrs. Gandhi throughout the emergency. The contortionists, however, began to lean more towards the left and the slanting intricacies of the Chinese-oriented wing. The Communist Party of India split at this time, and it became CPI and CPIM. So moderates, and they were allied, allied with both. This was like a major event. So he talks about that. Now, pictures Singh and Parvati. On the one hand, the, the slum, the ghetto, fails to become a power in the novel. On the other hand, um, I should mention one thing. One of the children of, of Midnight is uh, Salim's nemesis, and his name is Shiva, taken from the Hindu god. He's a powerful military general. He's very um, quick to fight, kind of brutal, and all about power. In the conference of the children, when Salim says, we should all work together, Shiva says, no, who are you to tell us this? And so the novel also dramatizes both the potential and I would say the dark side of popular 
democracy. I don't think we need to learn about it, actually, <laughs> but in the world. But in fact, Rashti is really kind of amazing in showing you both those. So Shiva rises to become an army general, and one of his things is he, um, so I should come to this final episode first. Um, the final episode, and I think this explains why the novel in some places is so mischievous and happy and in other places so dark. The final uh, chapters, this also tells you why it was banned, is about the rule of Indira Gandhi. I don't know if, you, if you're all familiar with Indira Gandhi, who was the first um, woman prime minister of India, came to power in the 60s. She was the daughter of Jawaharlal Nehru, so she had this lineage. Uh, the Gandhi family has pretty much ruled the Congress party. They're sort of like the Kennedys of India. And Indira Gandhi, um, in 1975, out of fear that there was an opposition growing in the country to her rule, because she was basically in power for 20 years, imposed the emergency. That's considered a very dark chapter in Indian history, where at least the freedom of the press and free elections have been a given. And so when she put all her opposition leaders into prison, she imprisoned editors of newspapers, and it went from 75 to 77. It was a very dark chapter of history. And my reading of this is, Rashti is writing in retrospect from that moment, which is why the children of midnight are slowly eliminated by Indira Gandhi in the novel. He calls her the widow. She lost her husband very young. She becomes like this powerful, horrific widow figure. And one of the things that her son did her son was like, you know, um, sort of like a young Kennedy, but far more, I would say, um, both brutal, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. He went abroad and I don't know what sort of degree he got, but he came back and he decided that India's um, sort of ills could be addressed by A, controlling the population, and B, beautifying Delhi. So he took a bulldozer and he just basically raised the slums to the ground. Right? rendering people homeless, um, saying, you don't want slums here. And then he and his party workers, the youth wing of the Congress party, decided they were going to launch a sterilization campaign. So they picked up men and women of all ages and coerced them into sterilization. This is a very dark chapter of India's history. And so that's what happens in the novel to Salim. He's picked up by the goons and he's sterilized. Okay, now, he's not going to produce any more children. So what is going to happen to the gifts of the children of midnight? Well, it turns out his nemesis, Shiva, has a predilection for philandering. And he doesn't like it when the women get pregnant. So what happens? He moves from woman to woman. But as a result, at the end of it, the children of midnight are all over the population. So I read it as a positive. Others read it as, this is so sad, because Salim is falling apart. Salim is barely able to tell a story. Salim is finally rendered impotent. Very strange now, right? But the hero is impotent, but in a way, there's still a kind of future. So just a few things I want to show you here. This is Indira Gandhi, and he describes her. Um, he says, her hair parted in the center was snow white on one side and black as night on the other, so that depending on which profile she presented, she resembled either a stoat or an ermine. <laughs> Um, clearly the novel is not going to do well. Now I think that the emergency really blackened her record because what is remarkable is that many countries in South Asia have had women leaders, which, you know, we haven't yet. Right. And then she's as Prime Minister, 66 to 1977. There's also something I find kind of stunning about her taking the Garawana and Asari, like, you know, here is supposedly a very traditional country, but she ruled for a long time. And there's something that might be more familiar. She came to the United States to uh, see Reagan when he was the um, state visit. Um, this is uh, something from the newspapers when the Indian emergency was declared. Uh, it was a major thing. I mean, people were traumatized for years afterwards. Editors of newspapers, intellectuals, you know, she just put them in prison because she was worried that they were going to foment some kind of unrest in the country. Um, and this tells you all of civil liberties suspended. So Rashti is really writing Midnight's Children from the retrospect of what happened here. It came out in 81, he's writing it right after the emergency, which is why he seems so. But at the end of the novel, one of the children of this general, Shiva, the horrible Shiva, um, is born to Parvati the witch, who is a positive, wonderful character. And because she's already pregnant and will have people ask her, question her, 
Salim decides to marry her. Their child then becomes the adopted child of Parvati and Salim, who's actually the child of Shiva. One thing the novel does is question genealogy at all levels. Nothing is pure, everything is mixed, everyone comes from everywhere else, and everyone is mixed. And if you've tested your DNA, you know that. So, the child born to them, I think this is a nice place to end. This, by the way, was her son, who was this horrible Sanjay Gandhi, who did all of this stuff. He was killed in an air crash. I've never heard people say this, it's a horrible thing to say, but people said it was probably a kind of deliverance for India. Um, so the son that is born has large ears and is called Ganesha. Ganesha in the Hindu pantheon is the god of everything good. We invoke Ganesha when we start a project. So he is the god of auspiciousness. He is the god of literature. He is the writer of scripture. And so I think with a Ganesha afloat in the world and all of Shiva's children, it doesn't sound so dark to me. So that's the story, which is the magic children are still somewhere among the billion of Indians. I just want to stop there and ask you if you have questions. Okay. Shuji, uh, I want to go back to the food. Yes. I wonder if this, uh, the importance of this as a symbol uh, for India is not also enhanced by his Cambridge experience for this yeah. reason. I, I had a similar experience at Oxford, and the college food was awful. Yes. I think the question we'd ask is, did we or did or do That's I? Eat this? Yes. Where you got refuge was the Indian restaurant. Yes. This is. Now, I can imagine what this would be for an Indian. Yes. Well, anyway, do you think that might? I mean, is there anything in the critical literature or in your own feelings about that that would? Yeah, well, that's... you know, so he did. Grow, he did grow up with this parents in a very kind of South Asian family. So you would have found that both at home. Um, I just think there's something very distinctive in the kind of, the idea of mixing so many things to produce something else, which is basically what India is. But you're right, it could have been heightened by the fact that he really saw his own food for the first time from the perspective of, you know, being British and from the outside. Yeah. yeah. It is a great metaphor. You have so many. Uh, I mean, I only read you two or three. Throughout, the food is really powerful in this pickling. Other um, thoughts, questions? Getting back to the languages, I'm just curious. Uh, all those languages are they are they dialects or are they distinctive languages? I mean, can can people understand each other? Two provinces away, or yeah, that's a good question. Oh, so are all the languages, um, actual languages or dialects, can people understand each other across provinces? So um, many of these languages derive from Sanskrit. So there, there are vocabulary words that I would be able to get. The South Indian languages are completely distinct. Kannada, uh, Malayalam, Telugu, and Tamil are completely distinct. They have a very, um, I'm actually not even sure what language group they come from, uh, but they have a smattering of Sanskrit, so I'd be able to recognize the Sanskrit terms, but I wouldn't recognize 80% of the language. Marathi and Gujarati, not that far. My Bengali friends, and I've had so many of them, because many of them study English literature, my Bengali friends always say, okay, if you just pay attention, you're a Hindi speaker, you can understand what we're saying. <laughs> I can, sort of, you know, but, um, but I think it's also the case that um, for your work, often you live in more than one state, and as children you pick up more than one language. So where English is very much the lingua franca, but there's a large part that is Hindi speaking, and because it's in the north, and because the north is a little more powerful, people have had to learn Hindi, and they, they resent it. South resents the imposition of Hindi. They were actually language riots when they said, no, we don't want Hindi to be imposed on us. So language politics is really big uh, in India. You know, and, um, but often people can understand two or three. Is there a movement in the schools to teach the language of the, that particular place, like, you know, like the Dunham Wales, and try to recover languages, or does recovery even necessary? So is there a movement in the schools to try to recover languages? Um, so every, in every state, you are taught that language. You know, so um, schools in Maharashtra, 
would have Marathi. There are some English language schools, but as I said, that's the very privilege of access to it. Otherwise, you're studying possibly Hindi, possibly you're studying some Marathi. But it's, it's kind of sad and tragic that, in a way, um, you know, we couldn't do more to cultivate these languages. I mean, in some sense, English became a great language, I think, partly because people like Shakespeare wrote in it. They wrote in the vernacular. They were, they were, you know, performing in a bear pit where people came to see bears fight and then they would see on for Shakespeare's play. It wasn't high culture. We made it high culture much later. Um, and I think the same thing in India if people were to write in those languages. So in Africa, Gugi Thiongo, who wrote his first novel in English, decided that he would go back and only write in Kikuyu. And, you know, that was his commitment. But then we wouldn't get to read him. I can only read Gugi in English. So there is this, this problem. I think we need a translation machine. That's the next thing. <laughs> yes, or your, your iPhone, yeah. Or what they have in sci-fi movies. Uh, uh, Indian English is yes. more lilting than American or even British English, I think. In, in that sense. There's, a, there's a lyrical quality to Indian English. Will you, will you come and say that at home? Because you always, yeah. my husband and I always fight about this. Well, that's not a question. I mean, that's, uh, that's certainly, all of us are too far, almost always have an Indian student, and I have, I just have to get used to that little thing around it. It's all the same words and so on. It, is it possible that that comes out of the indigenous? Is there a pattern, a lyrical pattern to indigenous languages? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Um, I think. It's a, combina it's, it's a combination of, oh, oh, sorry, does English, the South Asian English or Indian English is very lyrical and the question is whether it comes out of some of the rhythms of indigenous languages. And I think it is a combination of standard British English, like the BBC English, matched with certainly some rhythms of speech that are indigenous. I think that's probably true. Yeah. Well. Let's thank Professor Thank you. Thank you all for being with us.